NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. All right, so I love quotes, all right? And I want you guys just to take a quick look at the quote that I have on the slide right now. It's not always what we don't know that gets in our way, but sometimes it's what we think we know that can get in our way or keep us from learning. And that's really gonna be the focus of this uh, presentation is really tapping into the things that we think we know and how those things that we think we know can get in the way, okay? And before we dive in, I wanna do an exercise with you all. And normally when I do this, I have people uh, get out of their seats and stand up and form two lines in the room, but I'm not gonna do that because we have limited time. So instead what I want you guys to do is look at the person either next to you or behind you. And I want you to think in your head who you think that person might be in terms of these identifiers, okay? We've got race, age, gender, income, religion, physical ability, primary language, marital status, sexual orientation, uh, gender identity. Take a look at the person next to you or behind you, really, I want you guys to do this, and spend about, I don't know, 10 seconds, which is a really long time. Spend about 10 seconds looking at that person, thinking about who you think that person is, okay? No talking, don't say anything out loud, just notice what's going on in your head. Okay, go. Was it awkward? Was it, was it uncomfortable? No, who said no? Natural? Exactly, it is, it is natural. We do that all the time, right? But when I've done this exercise before, and what people have told me is, yeah, it's a little awkward, a little uncomfortable, but what they found most uncomfortable was the fact that they knew the person looking at them was doing that to them, right? Not that they were just doing it to the other person, but the other person was doing it to them. And you're absolutely right, this is what we do. We're human, all right? This doesn't make us bad people because we judge or decide who people are based on what they look like or what they talk like or how they dress or whatever it is, right? Our brains are conditioned to make snap decisions about who we think people are, okay? All right, so let's talk about the word humility. We're gonna dive into this concept of cultural humility now. Who wants to take a stab at the definition of humility? What do you guys think that means? Anyone, just shout it out. What do you think it means to be humble? Modesty, modesty. yep. Yeah, modesty. Say that again? Recognition that we don't know shit, I like that. Shit is my favorite word, I like that, yes. Exactly, to be humble, means to recognize that you don't know shit, right? Like you don't know everything there is to know, right? It's the opposite of being prideful. It's the opposite of being, you know, all knowing, right? And so when we talk about cultural humility, has anybody in the room heard of that concept before? I know we've heard of the word culture and we've heard of the word humility and humble, but that together, cultural humility. Have, has anybody heard that concept before? Okay. You want to come up here and help me teach this? Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So, cultural humility is a concept that was developed in the 1990s by this woman here. This is Dr. Melanie Turvalon. Melanie is a pediatrician, or at the time in the 90s, was a pediatrician at Oakland Children's Hospital right here in California. And I had the privilege of spending a week with Melanie about three years ago. She came to Milwaukee and did this really intensive week-long training focused on cultural humility, okay? And there were about a, a dozen of us from around the state of Wisconsin who spent the week with her and became ambassadors um, in this concept. And what is this concept? So uh, essentially how it all started was the at Oakland Children's Hospital in the 90s, there was a lot of, um, uh, racial tension, a lot of stuff, not only in LA, this was around the time of the Rodney King um, riots, and uh, Melanie and her colleague, Jan Marie Garcia, were tapped by the, you know, the high ups at the hospital to develop a very comprehensive 
uh, cultural competency training program for all staff at the hospital, every single person who worked at this hospital, okay? And um, just to give an example of one, of one of countless examples of things that were going on was uh, there was an incident where there was a nurse who was dealing with one of the patients in the hospital and the patient was complaining that their pain was very severe. And the nurse refused to give the patient any pain medication. So the, another nurse came in and asked, what's going on? Why are you not giving this patient more medication? And the other nurse's response was, well, you know, I went to a class and I learned that uh, Hispanic people always over-exaggerate their pain. <laughs> and so that example, again, many examples like that prompted Oakland Children's Hospital to really look at this and, and uh, figure this shit out, right? Like, this can't be happening. This is not good. This is not good for patients, right? So Melanie and her colleague Jan spent years developing this program. And as they were diving in and, and, and looking at it and talking to hundreds and hundreds of people to really figure out what are the problems here and how do we address these problems, what they came to discover was, you know, this idea of cultural competency, you know, it's not, that's not a, a bad thing. It's, it's you know, it's, it's good. It recognizes that, you know, uh, that people are different and that we need to take time to get to know people and, and you know, what makes different, you know, people tick. And, uh, but what, she, what Melanie didn't like so much was the fact that this word competency implies that there's like an end point, right? Like, oh, I go to these trainings and now I'm culturally competent and I know everything there is to know about, you know, this culture that's different than mine. And she didn't really like that. So she came up with this, you know, concept, cultural humility, all right? And these are the four principles, all right? And I want you guys to think about this uh, as a framework, okay? And I can tell you that in the three years that I have learned about this and have been teaching about this and applying this in my everyday life, I really like this as a framework because it makes a hell of a lot of sense. And it really, I think, has really impacted in a good way how I deal with people, okay? So these are the four principles. I'm gonna uh, go through these uh, very briefly and then in a bit, I will talk about how these might look in practice, okay? All right, so first one, self-reflection, lifelong learner, client as expert, community-based advocacy, and institutional consistency, okay? Those are the four principles. All right, first one, self-reflection. What does that mean? Okay, we, we hear a lot about being self-reflective and looking inward and, and all of that. And so to be self-reflective means like asking yourself things like, you know, what am I thinking about this cultural group? Why am I thinking that? What is that based on? Where does that come from? You know, what are my stereotypes? What are my biases? What are my attitudes about this person, right? Or this cultural group or this group of people? What happens if I act on those biases or assumptions or attitudes that I hold? You know, like really taking the time to really think about that, all right? Sometimes when I talk about this, people will say, well, you know, Gina, Stereotypes exist for a reason, because sometimes they're true. And my response to that is, oh my gosh, no, that's totally not the point. You totally missed the point, right? Um, the problem with stereotypes is this, right? Stereotypes decide what the one story is about that person, right? Have you guys ever seen this TED Talk? It's phenomenal, all right? Write this down or look at it in the materials. Her TED Talk is, is really wonderful. All right. So that's just a little bit about self-reflection and lifelong learner. And the lifelong learner piece goes back to uh, the, you know, the concerns that Melanie had about this competency idea, that competency sort of implies this end point. Uh, cultural humility, on the other hand, would indicate that, no, this is like a lifelong thing. We are never gonna know everything that there is to know about other people, right? Like people different from us, anybody else, like anybody, right? We're never gonna know everything that there is to know. All right, so the second principle, client as expert. All right, what Tyra Patterson yesterday, said yesterday is spot on with this principle. Do you guys remember when she said that she was conditioned to believe that she was not an equal partner? Do you guys remember that? I wrote that down, that was beautiful. That was exactly this, all right? Client as expert, as the second principle of cultural humility, is exactly that. that 
the client is also an expert. So when you think about the client-attorney relationship, yes, the attorney is an expert when it comes to the law, the legal process, you know, what goes on in the courtroom, who the players are, what resources are available out there, you know, all of those things. That is the area of expertise for the, for the attorney. But you know what? The client is an expert on their life, their experiences, their values, their hopes, their dreams, everything, right? And they're an equal partner in that. And so think about what Tyra Patterson said yesterday, okay? An equal partner in this relationship, all right? Oh, this is a tiny symbol for listening, and I love it, because we don't listen just with our ears, right? We listen with our eyes, our undivided attention, and our heart, our whole selves. That is truly listening. Listening isn't looking at someone and just hearing the words, and, but thinking about what it is you're gonna say in response, right? I mean, I think, sometimes I think we think we're really great listeners, but we kind of suck at it. I suck at it anyway. I, um, I'm always thinking about, you know, oh, what am I gonna say next? Or, oh, I don't really agree with that, or, you know, whatever it is. But we need to get better at listening, listening with our, with our eyes, our undivided attention, our heart, and our ears. And I don't know if you guys read Cynthia Roseberry's materials, um, but I love something she wrote in there about uh, listening with our eyes. You know, the first time that, is Cynthia in here? I don't see her. Um, when we meet with our client for the very first time, listen with our eyes, okay? Really look at that client in their eyes and listen to what they're saying, all right? So one of the lawyers that I work with, and I work in Wisconsin, and one of the attorneys who works in our Milwaukee juvenile office shared a story recently about a case where she was representing a mom in a child in need of protection or services case. case. Um, and the social worker in the case was insistent that the mom put the the, her kids' mattresses on bed frames. The mattresses were on the floor, okay? And social worker just had a big problem with that and thought it was you know, unsanitary, this is not a good thing. You know, mom, you really need to get these mattresses off the floor. What the social worker never bothered to ask or have a conversation with, with this mom, was why she had the mattresses on the floor. And the reason she had them on the floor was because she lived in a neighborhood where there were a lot of drive-by shootings, all right? So she had them on the floor to protect her kids, all right? That is a perfect example of a social worker substituting her life experience, you know, and what she thinks is the right thing, the best thing for this mom, you know, based on her experience, and never bothering to really understand who this mom was and why she was doing this, right? All right, so we have self-reflection, right? Client is expert. We're gonna move on to the third one. Community-based advocacy, all right? And so the way I kind of like to think about this with the four principles, so the, the first two I kind of think of as more like what do we as individuals need to do in order to be culturally humble? And then principles three and four I kind of think of as on a more global level. Uh, so community-based advocacy, what does that mean in this context? So basically it means that you know, if there is a community out there that you want to serve or that you want to help, you really need to engage that community and finding out, you know, what is it exactly do they need, okay? Not what do we think they need, but what do they say they need, right? And so the example that Melanie gives is, so let's say you want to house the homeless, all right? That's something you want to do. Well, if what you want to do is house homeless people, you darn well better talk to homeless people to find out, like, okay, where do they want to be housed? How do they want to be housed? What does this look like, right? So you have to engage that community. We don't get to decide what's best for them. They get to decide that, right? All right, so that's the third one. Fourth one, institutional consistency, okay? So what does that mean? That means that you know, we as individuals can do what we can to be culturally humble, right? We can be you know, self-reflective. Remember that the client is an equal partner, is an expert, and all of those things, but the institutions that we work for, right, the agencies, organizations that we work for, can practice or incorporate these cultural humility principles into, you know, agency policies, practices, you know, at all different levels of the organization, okay? 
and unless the organization is doing it on a consistent level, you know, it's, it's probably not gonna, it's probably gonna kind of fall apart, right? All right, is this making sense? Yeah, okay, so the four principles, again, I'm gonna say them again, being self-reflective and a lifelong learner, right? Client is an expert. Client brings something to the table too, all right? Community-based advocacy and institutional consistency. All right, so what does this look like in practice? All right, the IAT. I know a lot of people have talked about the implicit association test because I couldn't see it when um, Professor Cabardo asked you guys, but could you raise your hands again? Who has taken the IAT? Okay, so some of you have. Um, yeah, so just all you gotta do, I, really, I strongly encourage you to take it. It takes about maybe 10-ish minutes, all right? Carve out some time to do it. I suggest you do it on a laptop or a computer where you actually have a keyboard. Don't do it on your phone or your, your um, tablet because it's better if you have a keyboard. Um, you have to carve out enough time where you can do it uninterrupted because you can't just leave it and come back. You have to do it all in one sitting, all right? And, and yeah, there are a, a whole bunch of different uh, IETs you can take. Take the one on race. I have taken the IAT on race probably 10 times in the last, I don't know, five or six years. And I, I get different results every time, and I don't know what that's about. But, um, but I can tell you, like, I, sometimes, I don't, sometimes I don't like my results. And it's like, oh my God, like, what, you know, what does this mean? I need to, you know, what, what does this mean? You know, so I encourage you to take it and you could learn something about yourself, all right? Okay, what else can we do, all right, in order to, to uh, move down this road of being culturally humble? All right, we need to slow down, okay? And I think Professor Carbato's test with the, the colors, the Stroop test, right? The Stroop test, when you do it really fast, you're gonna screw it up because like that part of your brain that wants to make these automatic decisions about things kicks in and then you're, you know, you're starting to act on your biases and your assumptions and your stereotypes and that kind of thing, right? If you slow down, notice what it is that you're thinking, okay? I'm gonna give you guys an example. So my friend Rick um, in Madison, he just told me this the other day, that he was coming into our office building and in our building, uh, there, oftentimes there's this guy, Zeke, who is sleeping in the lobby of our building. He's homeless, Zeke is homeless. He has schizophrenia and uh, diabetes, all right? Everybody knows Zeke. We, you know, give him food, we go buy him a sandwich or whatever, orange juice, and um, everybody knows Zeke. So my friend Rick comes in to the office, and Zeke is in the lobby, and Rick is wearing his fraternity sweatshirt, and I hope I'm gonna get this right, Omega Phi Psi is his fraternity. Omega Psi Phi, okay, Psi Phi. Um, and it was the Greek letters, and Rick was talking to Zeke, and Zeke says, oh, Omega Psi Phi. And Rick was shocked that Zeke knew what the Greek letters were, okay? And that, and that it was a fraternity. And then later, Rick, he was telling me this, and, and he realized, he's like, it really bothered me that I was shocked that Zeke knew what that meant. He's like, why, why was I so shocked that Zeke knew these Greek letters and knew that this was a fraternity? You know, Rick was wondering, did, did I think that because, you know, Zeke is homeless and isn't gonna know this, or it's because he, you know, has a mental illness and he isn't gonna know this? And it really, you know, so Rick spent some time reflecting on why he had that reaction that he did, all right? So notice your thoughts, all right? Where are they coming from? Why am I thinking this? Does anyone in the room meditate? Raise your hand if you meditate. Okay, all right, this is my plug for meditation and mindfulness. So studies have shown that meditation reduces age and race implicit bias, all right? Studies have shown that, all right? And I could spend all day talking about meditation and mindfulness and what it does to your brain, but um, Medi regular meditation practice, regular mindful, mindful practices, so it's not just meditation. Yoga is an example of a mindful practice. You can mindfully eat. You can mindfully walk. It's just basically focusing on whatever it is that you're doing in that moment, right? And trying to get away from living in your head all the time. Um, but meditation strengthens that part of your brain that allows you to, to actually think about what it is that you're doing and not 
having the part of your brain that comes up with these automatic decisions um, and, and driving the bus, basically, okay? I know it's like a very oversimplified way of saying it, but again, scientific research shows that meditation reduces implicit race and age bias, all right? So, something else that you can think about doing, all right? Client, okay, I wanna segue a little bit into uh, the client as expert principle. Do you guys recognize the woman on the right? A lot of you probably do, yes, Deja Vishni, my colleague who just retired. Um, I have permission to use this photo. <laughs> this is her with her, uh, one of her clients from a few years ago. Um, so what does client as expert look like in practice, all right? What that looks like is maybe, I don't know, spending less time talking and more time listening, right, when we meet with our clients. Maybe asking clients, you know, I think somebody said this yesterday, maybe not starting right away with, uh, you know, okay, so tell me what happened, you know, we need to talk about this case right away, blah, 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 and I get that we're all super busy and we don't have enough time, but spending some time getting to know your client as a person, right, as a human being. Maybe asking your client, you know, where do you see yourself a year from now or five years from now? What are your hopes and dreams in life, you know? That's gonna get you to know your client a lot better and also shows that you see your client as a human being, right? Another thing I loved um, that Tyra and um, David were talking about yesterday is she said that uh, David showed some vulnerability while they were meeting, all right? And I think that us showing that we're human, I think sends a signal to our clients that we recognize them as human beings as well, right? So talking with clients that way. We don't want to be that nurse, right? <laughs> we don't want to be that social worker, right? We want to really get into what it is that our clients are feeling, you know, asking those questions like, you know, what, when you get into discussions about the case, asking questions like, you know, what were you feeling in that moment? Can you tell me a little bit more about why you did that, all right? And then also really noticing whatever, you know, if there's stuff going on in our head about, oh, I don't believe this person or, you know, Asking yourself, why is it? Why am I feeling this way, right? Moving on to community-based advocacy <laughs> and institutional consistency. What does that look like in practice, all right? So, community-based advocacy, one of the things that um, Melanie talks about is, you know, whatever community is that, you're, that you are wanting to serve or to help, you know, meet with that community in their community. Maybe we meet with our clients in our clients' homes, right? We, maybe we set up things to make sure that when we wanna meet with our community that we are doing it at a convenient time for them, okay? So let me give an example, and this kind of falls into both community advocacy and um, institutional consistency. So many, many years ago, one of our offices, we're, we're a statewide public defender organization, and one of our offices wanted to designate specific times during the day that clients or potential clients could come in and do their eligibility determination. So we have, we call it an e-form. And right, Margaret, it's like this really long, complicated <laughs> form you fill out to make sure the person uh, qualifies for our services financially, okay? So one of our offices wanted to set times uh, during the week that the clients could come and uh, do e-forms. And the thought was that, you know, this is gonna be a really great thing because it's gonna allow for support staff to not be interrupted throughout the day, you know, they can, know exactly when people are going to come in to do e-forms and then the rest of the time you know they can you know open cases and do the other administrative work that they need to do right but then the question was asked well is this good for clients i mean what if people can't get in during those time times that have been designated right i mean it seems so basic um, but this was something that was being considered you know and then when we actually sat down and everybody you know thought about it some more and talked about it, it's like, oh my God, this is so not client-centered. This is so not the direction we wanna go, right? So thinking about those kinds of things, right? You know, another example is, you know, we're a state, again, statewide agency. We have 37, 38 uh, trial offices located around the state. And one of the things that we 
train our staff on is, you know, if, a, if someone calls from, a, a, you know, three counties over and they have a case in your county, but they can't, they don't have the transportation to get over to your county to come in and do the e-form, do the e-form over the phone. And there was a little bit of pushback for a while because, you know, we have to get the client's signature and, you know, they have to verify that the information they provided is true and accurate and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, if we do it over the phone, we're not going to get the signature and blah, blah, blah. And it's like, you know what? Who cares? It's way better for the client to be able to do it over the phone than it is to try to make them come, you know, drive three counties over to do this thing in person. So, you know, things like that. Again, very basic, but, you know, really thinking about those kinds of things. Um, we used to do client satisfaction surveys. All right, that was a really good way for us to get feedback from clients about, you know, are we meeting your needs? You know, what's important to you? And overwhelmingly, the thing that was most important to them was they wanted to feel heard, right? They wanted to feel like their lawyer, the investigator, everyone on the defense team listened to them, took the time to hear what they had to say, all right? So, you know, you can do surveys to see if, if clients are actually feeling that way. Um, data collection, all right? So it, this is something that comes up too as a way to self-reflect, as a way to see how as an institution you're doing in terms of uh, cultural humility. Pull out some files. Pull out your last 10, 20 case files that you took to trial. And Notice, look, you know, examine, like, what are the races of the clients in these cases? You know, which, you know, of these last 20 cases where I asked for an investigator or other expert to work on the case, what are the races of those clients? Right? And if you see something that bothers you, then, again, again take some time to think about why is that? Okay? Hiring practices. All right, so um, this is an example of institutional consistency. So when we interview people for our lawyer positions, one of the questions that we ask is, okay, assume that you, that your client, you have a client who is a race different from your own, and that client says to you, you know, I really would prefer to have a lawyer of the same race as me. How do you respond to the client in that situation? It's one of our questions. And a lot of times people will answer, well, you know, I would assure the client that I have a lot of experience, you know, that, I, that I've been, you know, doing this work for so many years, that I'm on their side, I've had training, da 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 And I get where that answer comes from. It's not necessarily a bad answer. But the culturally humble answer would be, well, you know, I would put the pen down, and have a conversation with my client about, you know, can you talk to me some more about that? Like why, you know, can you tell me a little bit more about why you're feeling that way? Because there's probably a really good reason why the client's feeling that way, right? Fine, it's, it's about them. It's not about us, it's about them, right? So if any of you ever apply for a job at the Wisconsin PD's office, now you know the right answer. So, um, but that's an example, right? Is this making sense? Yeah, all right, do you guys have any questions? I like this. Um, in one sentence, to be culturally humble means this. In our relationships with other people, we are really careful to allow them to define and share what's most important to their cultural identity, most important to them, who they are, their story, right? Their values, their hopes, their dreams, what they want, all right? And this doesn't apply just in our attorney-client relationships. I mean, I think this applies in everything, our you know, coworker relationships, anything, right? So this is, this is what, it, what it is. Um, and again, I really, I have found it to be really helpful. I, I do take a lot of time, especially when I meet people for the first time, this sort of comes up automatically in my head, like, okay, Gina, you, you are not all knowing, you don't know shit about this person, you know, uh, listen to who they really are, ask questions, uh, listen more, talk less, ask open-ended questions. Notice the assumptions that I'm making, you know? Why am I making those assumptions, right? Don't make those assumptions, Gina, you know? You could be wrong about all this stuff, right? So I would really encourage you to apply this framework. There's a ton of stuff, you know, online that you can, re you can read more about. 
This, um, Melanie has some videos on YouTube that you can, you know, you can watch some videos to learn a little bit more about what this means and really kind of um, dig deep into this. Whenever I do these things, I like to end on a positive, hopeful note. Um, I know we do these, like, we do these conferences about race and it can be like, just feels so heavy and it is heavy and it, and it feels a lot of times like, you know, like we're never gonna, it's never gonna be better, right? But we can't think that way. We have to think positive. We have to be hopeful because if we're not, then what's the point in all of it, right? So I'm gonna end it on a positive, hopeful note with this video. I would describe my political views as the new right. I say that I'm left. Feminism today is man-hating. I would describe myself as a feminist 100%. I don't believe that climate change exists. We're not taking enough action on climate change. I think it's about time these people got off their high horse and started looking for credible problems that actually exist. It's absolutely critical that trans people have their own voice. That's not right. You can't, you know, you're, you're a man, be a man, or you're a female, be a female. Women do need to remember that we need you to have our children. Could I be friends with someone that's in the women's faces in the home? Um... Right, okay, well, I'm an expert at flat packs. If you have any trouble, just watch me. So it looks like I've got your instructions here. I think so. Let me help you. It's not just that bit there. Describe what it is like to be you in five adjectives. Okay, frustrating. Dedicated. Opinionated. Lucky. Ambitious, offensive, solemn. I have ups and downs. Strong. I don't want to say attacked. Misunderstood. Name three things you and I have in common. We're both male, we're both confident, and we're both loudly spoken. We know each other better than people who've known each other for 10 minutes should. You seem quite ambitious and positive, and you've got this really, um, got a glow. Do you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Your aura is pretty cool. I'm sensing. Are you. Uh, former military or something? People have said that, but there is no, really? there is no history. So are you then? Ex. Ex-military? Uh, yeah. If you're ex-military, I'm very proud of you already. Well, so. I grew up uh, in a bit of a rough state. I've experienced homelessness. I've known what it's like to have absolutely nothing. Yeah. So yeah, I'm definitely most grateful just, just for life. We've only just met, but I think you're the sort of person that would listen to me and we'd have a discussion rather than argue. Yeah, you could hang out with man. Let's go. Come on, Chad. What was that? You're right, mate. Fitter than a look. Perfect. Oh, yeah. There you go. It's basically, I think we just bought a bar. Yeah. Okay. Here you are. <laughs> Each take a bottle and place it on its corresponding markings on the bar. Attention. Please now stand to watch a short film. Feminism today is definitely an excuse for misandry, man-hating. If somebody said to me that climate change is destroying the world, then I'd say that is total piffle. So transgender, it is very odd. We're not set up to understand or see things like that. I am a daughter, a wife. I am transgender. I feel like the battle for feminism definitely isn't done. The fight is never going to be over, if I'm honest with you. You now have a choice. You may go, or you can stay and discuss your differences over a beer. <laughs> I'm only joking. <laughs> well, I'm having a drink. I'm having a drink. Yeah. I want to discuss. Beer. Yeah, beer and discuss. Cheers. At the end of the day, mate. About like reaching out to people, people yeah. yeah. And you know, even if you wanted to convince people about your point, the productive thing to do would be to sit it's down engaged, and have engage. Engage. I've been brought up in a way where everything's black and white, but life isn't black and white. Yeah, I'm just me. Yeah. <laughs> Smash the patriarchy. <laughs>
I'll give you my mobile number, you give me yours, uh -huh. and we'll keep in touch. I'd have to tell my girlfriend that I'll be texting another girl. <laughs> 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 <laughs>